Nikita Shamganov, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to, to have you on this one. I've been in the serverless space for a couple of years now. And I think like the biggest thing I've hear, heard people ask about for, for a long time is like, I want a serverless SQL relational database. I, I want some of that. And, and, and that's what you're kind of going on. So just background for people that don't know you, you're co-founder of Neon. That's what we're going to be talking a lot about today, which is the serverless Postgres database. Before that, you were, you were co-founder of MemSQL, now known as, as Single Store, which is a really interesting um, in-memory sort of HTAP type um, database as well. You also work at Coastal Ventures for the last couple of years, still there incubating Neon from there. So um, why don't you tell us um, uh, what what is Neon? Uh, happy to, yeah. So the, the short description of Neon is, is serverless Postgres. Um, obviously the world knows what Postgres is and it's one of the most uh, popular open source databases and that's the one that is growing its share still, right? If you go to dbenginerankings.com and look at the top five databases, um, and I'm going to call those databases commodity databases, basically the ones that are kind of the default choice for building apps, um, you will see that out of the top five, um, Postgres today is number three, I believe, after Oracle, MySQL, and SQL Server. Um, and then after Postgres, there's Mongo, and after Mongo, there's Redis. Um, and within those top five, Postgres is the one that's growing share, um, if you believe dbenginerankings.com. Uh, um, but kind of intuitively, it kind of feels that way, right? If you go and read Hacker News, uh, you will see more blog posts about Postgres uh, than about those other databases. Um, and certainly, um, you also see it's in the ecosystem. So uh, the ecosystem is building more and more extensions, more and more ORMs, uh, more and more, I don't know, GraphQL front ends uh, for Postgres. So clearly the world is, is, is excited. So what is Neon? Uh, Neon is, is um, taking uh, Postgres and making it serverless. And when you think about it um, kind of as an engineer is, what would I do if I wanted to, to make uh, uh, Postgres serverless? Well, people would probably start thinking, it's like, okay, well, well, maybe I put it in containers, put it in Kubernetes, um, and then, but then what? It's a stateful system. Um, and because it's a stateful system, um, as you're changing the size of the container that Postgres runs in, uh, or you're moving that container from one place to another, you will need to move the data. And so, and data is not that easy to move. Uh, I mean, it takes time. It's... Uh, uh, it, it has certain amount of affinity and gravity to the, the, the place that, that, that runs there. You can also say, well, I will completely redesign everything from scratch and I will build some sort of, you know, routing system and then requests will, will choose where they go. And that's how I'll be kind of in a multi-tenant way, allocate, um, uh, allocate resources per request. Well, that's going away from Postgres. That is a brand new system. That is a, uh, and there are systems like this out there, you know, you know, DynamoDB uh, or, or Cassandra uh, and whatnot. And those, if you like squint at them, you will see that they're mostly key value. They're not allowing you to run full fledged SQL. And, you know, moreover, they don't allow you to run um, full fledged Postgres with like all its extensions and sophisticated compute and storage procedures. The observation is that the key value request is um, is bounded in the amount of resources it consumes uh, versus a, a SQL request or a transaction, uh, and especially multi-statement transaction is not bounded with the with the amount of resources it consumes. So, the enabling technology that allows you to make uh, Postgres serverless is separation of storage and compute, and we'll certainly talk talk more about it once you separate storage and compute. Um, you have an extra degree of freedom of where you can put that compute, you know, this node or that node. And by moving, you can move it, compute a lot faster. Um, and, and, and that what allows you to, um, to build a serverless offering. So in short, Neon is serverless Postgres. It achieves that by separation of storage and compute um, and gives you um, additional uh, additional capabilities, additional features uh, for you to build and run your app. Awesome. I love it. So two, two really interesting things on there I want to follow up on. First, you're talking about the growth of, of Postgres in particular in this area. What do you think account 
What, what's accounting for that growth? Why is it, you know, gaining share compared to MySQL and, and other ones? Yeah, I, I really thought about it deeply. Um, and uh, I've been observing that for, for years. Um, I think the, the moment that Postgres like really became visible and known to every developer was Heroku. And I think it, it, it you know, goes back to, I, I don't know when, 2009 maybe, uh, when Heroku introduced Heroku Postgres and made that the default database. Um, that became like a, a, a distribution um, a distribution platform for Postgres. Um, but if you also step back and think, what are the contributing factors for growth of Postgres compared to MySQL? They, that they, there are, you know, architecture and license choices. Uh, you know, Postgres is, has a Postgres license, which is the most permissible, permissible license on the planet. Um, and, uh, Postgres is not owned by anyone. So in that way, it's very similar to Linux. Like it's like by design of the community, Postgres community, it is impossible to take ownership of Postgres. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, as opposed to MySQL, that first of all, it has a, a GPL license, which is less permissible, right? It's, it, 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 contagious. it is contagious. So, um, you know, it, you, you think twice before bringing MySQL into your organization. You have to run it by your lawyers. Um, it's not like GPL licenses is, is, is something that's, uh, uh, you know, particularly new, um, but it still adds a certain amount of friction where versus Postgres in a, in a way is a no regret. Um, the second is very database specific. Uh, Postgres chose uh, to be uh, squeaky clean with regard to uh, standards. Um, and so the surface area is richer and the way, uh, um, uh, Postgres implemented those features are quote unquote by the book. Um, and that is important because it doesn't surprise you, you know, um, at places MySQL, and I happen to know MySQL very well because single store implemented MySQL via protocol and a type system. Yeah. As you know, when you look at the type system, uh, at, 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 at times you're like, whoa, that's a weird decision here. That's a weird decision there. Um, MySQL didn't support schemas for a long time. Uh, MySQL didn't have full SQL surface area with window functions for a long time. I think he has it now. Um, and all of those things are, are just like a no event for Postgres, like Postgres has it all. Um, so I think that was, that was another big deal um, for, for Postgres of again, being kind of purist towards open source and standards uh, that over a long run, and database projects tend to span decades, um, add up to, to developer trust and community. I think there is a third thing about Postgres, which is extensions. And extensions allow you to build uh, a, a massive ecosystem. And so when people think about Postgres, they don't think about just the database. They think about just the database and the full ecosystem of extensions uh, that you can bring with the database. The most popular are PostGIS, uh, Timescale. Um, there is a handful of others uh, that are, you know, making the, the top five very easy to find out on the internet. Um, but extensions are a very, very big deal. Yeah, I totally agree. Those are great points, and I think you know that distribution point you made. I, I, I think of when I started programming, it was it was Django and Heroku, and because of that, both those like very yes. Postgres heavy. That was the first database I used. And, and honestly, now for the last couple of years, been doing a lot of serverless stuff in terms of AWS Lambda and using a ton of DynamoDB. And like, it's amazing how much sort of your compute platform sort of determines your database choice in, in some of those ways, at least just pushes you in, in, in sort of default ways. Um, I like that point you made about the extensions too and, and postages and, and um, uh, timescale. Those are ones I think about. I know AWS like restricts things like which Postgres extensions you can use with RDS and things like that. Does Neon allow sort of bring your own extensions or what's that, what's that look like, especially as a managed provider? As of this point in time, uh, we bless a handful of extensions. Um, and, you know, PostgreSQL is, is, is certainly one of those. Um, in the future, we would allow you to bring your own extension. Um, and people are already asking for it uh, because, um, you know, some extensions we, we just didn't compile. Um, it's it actually, it's not that hard to support. You just need to compile those extensions in. Um, but many people actually build their custom extensions. Um, and those we actually want to support. And what we're thinking of allowing people to do is to give them 
the ability to compile that extensions into uh, a Postgres instance themselves and then push it as a either a Docker container uh, or maybe a micro VM, probably Docker container um, into into Neon. Underneath will my translate the, the, the Docker container into a micro VM anyway, because we would, you know, for custom extensions, we would need some sort of VM boundaries around it. Um, but that's, I think, what the vehicle is going to be in the future. We're committed to to supporting custom extensions. Awesome. And and just going back then to that serverless point, Neon being, you know, serverless Postgres, that, that term, it's sort of overloaded and everyone's trying to grab a piece of it. But like, what do you, what, when you think of serverless Postgres, like what, what aspects of serverless do you think um, Neon has that, that makes it serverless? Well, the, the most important, there are two couple things that come to mind. The first one is you don't think about sizing. So you, you say, I need Postgres. And in two seconds, you get a connection stream. Um, and that's all your interface with the, with the service. Um, then within that connection string, uh, behind that connection string is a Postgres, is, is Postgres and it's Postgres compute. What's the size of that compute? In the moment you can query it, right? You know, via Postgres, um, uh, um, uh, system functions and, uh, system tables. So you can find out what the size of that compute, but we will change that, the size of that compute under, um, uh, behind the covers based on the intensity of your workload. We will also scale it down to zero um, if you don't use that at all. And today, cold start is about two seconds, and I think over time will increase, uh, will reduce uh, the cold start. I think the um, the lowest bound that we can push it to is a hundred milliseconds. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll keep making investments in this area. So not thinking about sizing is one. That's what makes it serverless. The second thing that makes it serverless uh, is consumption-based pricing, right? So we can have subscription-based pricing or we can have consumption-based pricing. And subscription-based pricing is what you typically see in many, many uh, database products. When you say, well, you have a database of size X and this is gonna cost you X dollars a month. Um, you see it all over the place. What what I think is 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 people want is a consumption based pricing, where you know if you're using more you're spending more, if you're using less you're spending less, and and then you're efficient. Our interests are aligned. Uh, uh, those those idiosyncrasies uh, secrecies it really come come in once you start rolling out your sales team. Yeah. Um, and if you are a subscription then the, your sales team is very incented to sell you a bigger and bigger subscription, um, which oftentimes ends up being shelfware, which over time leads to churn because like your, your users are not idiots and they, yeah. they do the math in their end. Um, consumption based pricing, I think is universally better um, for infrastructure and it allows, it allows users to, it just simplifies their lives. Right. And then you can, you know, potentially give discounts for bigger commits and whatnot. But that's really going into the sales motion. I think um, consumption based pricing is strictly better for the user, but you can only deliver on consumption based pricing if you are serverless and if your own infrastructure allows for a consumption based um, uh, usage. I love that. I love that point about the alignment of incentives with with consumption base, and you know you can get the short term win with that subscription based pricing, and um, right. it's sort of like you can you can shear a sheep, you know, many times you can only slaughter it once, sort of thing. Um, in terms of consumption based pricing, what does that look like? Is it like Planet Scale, where it's based on number of rows read, or is it based on how many compute instances are are running, and that sort of scales up and down based on what you're doing, or what's that look like for Neon? Yeah, we haven't rolled out our pricing, uh, and there are uh, uh, intense debates that are that are happening um, uh, internally about what it's going to look like. It will be consumption based. That is absolutely um, uh, the case. But what are the ex exact details? So here's here are the things that we do know. Right, we will charge for storage and compute separately. Um, in a way, uh, Neon is bottomless. Uh, which means if you if you go and, and create your database, we, and then you get a connection string, and you keep pushing data through that connection string into Neon, you will never run out of space. So, um, and for us internally, 
for you know an empty database will will probably spend one page, um, and then for which is eight kilobytes, and for a very large database will will you know spend terabytes of, of space, and the cold data of those terabytes of space, the ones that you might not be using, um, then we'll flush that down to S3, and we'll absolutely pass those savings into to, to the user, right? So storage is a lot cheaper than um, for Neon than for for um, for everybody else. Um, again, it doesn't make Neon cheap. Like it's not going to be a, a, a cheap product. It's going to be efficient uh, in in the way it consumes cloud resources. And some of those savings will be part uh, passed to the user. Um, and then we'll charge separately for compute and bandwidth. Uh, um, Unfortunately, I would I would love to not charge for bandwidth, but we kind of have to. Um, yeah. And if you're if you have an endpoint that points into the internet, uh, that's part of your your cogs uh, on the cloud, which you uh, run with the cloud provider. Um, and then with regards to compute, um, I'm not sure I love re uh, Rose Read Red uh, or uh, and Rose Written. Uh, it's certainly one of the options on the table. Um, uh, what 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 I like so far is that really on a per second basis, there is a certain size of compute we're allocating to the user. And so we can just add up all those seconds, um, add certain amount of margin, obviously for, you know, for providing value and writing the service and, and then give it back to the user. And that's very similar to what it costs us. Uh, and I think it's relatively straightforward to understand. So so far, my 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 head is in in doing something like this, where you know that you will never spend more than you know the large, the absolute largest instance um, um, multiplied you know per second multiplied by the number of seconds you're using it, and of course it scales down to zero, um, so it caps the amount of spend that you have, but then you you gain efficiencies by not using you know the largest instance all the time. Yeah. So that is where my head is at on the on how to charge for for compute, um, but we we haven't rolled out pricing yet, and so there's still some intense debates going on. Yeah, it's it's interesting with the move con to consumption based pricing. A little bit of that unknown and like having to re-educate people on it, where previously they just buy a giant instance, you know, have it at low utilization yeah. most of the time, but at least they knew what their bill was going to be, and now it's like, hey, this is going to be cheaper for you. You just have to trust a little bit and understand what your, yeah. what your, your metrics are. Yeah. I think that we know for sure that, that, um, uh, branching will be free. Yeah. So, uh, you can have as many branches as you want because branches is a part of our architecture. Uh, they're implemented at the storage tier. And so it's, you know, creating a branch is free for us. Uh, it should be free to the user for the user as well. Awesome. Awesome. I, I'm super excited to get into the tech around branching. One one last question, like product based. You mentioned like pricing still rolling out. I know y'all. It's it's September 2022 right now. Uh, you're in private beta. What, do you have any sort of timelines on when you'd like to get it um, public and GA, or what do you think in there? Yeah. Um, so pricing is going to roll out early Q1 uh, next year. Uh, we have, I think, we're pushing 2,000 users on the on the platform right now. Uh, so. Very excited to have that and just um, uh, starting because we, we opened the gates uh, June 15th. So we keep onboarding users um, every day, uh, um, you know, uh, probably around 50 users every day. Um, and more and more users sign up. Um, so we're, we're excited about it. What's gating that really is um, our, our two features. First of all, we need to have pricing in Billy, right? Yeah. We need to roll out what our pricing actually is. And it's one of the uh, most common questions uh, when we talk to our community. The second thing is um, uh, we teased everybody with branching uh, on on the front page of, of Neon, on neon.tech. And, um, um, and branching is, um, is there. It's there. You can consume it via an API. But we don't have beautiful UI uh, that supports it, where it's like literally being built right now and, and rolled out and we run user interviews. So we want to make sure that branching experience is, um, is very understandable to, uh, for the user. Um, I kind of want to emphasize this point. When you build something that, that people, people kind of relate to, which is like Postgres. So, you know, I make an API call, I push a button, I get Postgres. Nobody's confused there, right? It's very easy to understand what that is. Uh, branching 
changes the way people think and interact with the database, at least somewhat, right? You have your main branch and then you can create another branch and it creates a full fork of the database. Um, and now because storage and compute are separate, so potentially you can create multiple compute endpoints and assign them to branches. So that introduces complexity. Um, it's not particularly rocket science, but we still want to run it through the user interviews and make sure that people like really, really get it and love it. So, um, you know, the, the, the infrastructure for, for uh, branching is there and it works and there are people using it every day. Um, but that, uh, that UX and DevX and, and API is, is being iterated on. So that's the other thing that is, that is, that is gating us to just open it for everyone. Um, we think Q1 is where the, we will open the flood, floodgates. And we're also working with a few partners that can consume, um, and I, I can't really disclose it just yet, but uh, we're going to be rolling out it very, very, very soon, uh, where you'll be able to push a neon button on somebody else's platform. Um, and that will instantly create Postgres for you. So for those platforms, there will be no invite gate. Awesome. I, I mean, that makes me go back to Heroku as well and how you could spin up different providers and all those different things and just how useful that was to, to spin that up. Um, I also love that point on branching, especially like when you see technology where there's like a step change in the speed of, of how something works, like getting a full copy of your database, just how that mm -hmm. completely changes the use cases around it, right? Like when we went from deploying once a quarter to once a, a day or, or hour or minutely, uh, you know, it just changes all sorts of things that you almost can't even predict and, and need to think about reworking a lot of different things. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we also think of that um, if the moment we have branching, that would allow people to also publish uh, read only versions of their database um, and potentially accessing them um, kind of like GitHub, you know, there are public repos in GitHub and you can have public, Postgres databases, and you can go and either query them read only, and you bring your own compute, so it doesn't cost anything anything to the person who published the database. It 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 costs something for the person who is querying the database, yeah. uh, which is how it should be. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, it it allows you to push a button and fork that. So now you can publish a WordPress database. You can publish, or you, you can create a, a bunch of templates that are only visible to your um, organization. Uh, and they become kind of starting points for people to build apps or starting po points to run uh, uh, tests, uh, NCIs. So I, I think I think lots of things can be done. Very lots of very cool things can be done with that separation of storage and compute. Yeah, awesome. I love it. So going into that, I want to go deeper on the on the technical stuff because I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of great stuff here. I mean, first of all, you're a multiple time tech co-founder of like hard infrastructure stuff. I love this like pin tweet that you have on Twitter. So you're talking about the three step formula for infrastructure startup success. And the first one is, hey, find a 10x architectural advantage somewhere in cost and speed in a large category. So some sort of technological change that unlocks something that wasn't available before, and then just build a really good team to exploit it and, and really focus on the developer experience. So First of all, like for Neon, I think you mentioned it earlier, but what's the what's the 10x architectural advantage that, that Neon has that you're exploiting here? Yeah, great question. Um, and um, uh, the the answer here is, and I'm going to go kind of step by step, right? The architectural advantage is separation of storage and compute and integration of um, uh, storage with S3. Right, S3 is like a big component, and if you read our blog posts, um, you will you will get more details about how this works exactly. Exactly how we maintain low latency for the storage, um, but still offload cold data to S3. So that 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 is um, our 10x advantage number one. 10x advantage number two is like what it allows us to do, and, and this is serverless, and we um, implement serverless today uh, by orchestrating containers. So that, that would allow us to put Postgres in a container. Um, we're actually exploring micro VMs lately uh, 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 and uh, you know, Firecracker and Cloud Hypervisor are, are extraordinary technologies. Uh, they allow us to do live migrations and um, well, Cloud Hypervisor, not Firecracker, but um, Firecracker, you can freeze the world um, and then move it somewhere else. And as you do it, you don't even, it's possible to not even break the TCP connection. 
So, so serverless and that, that serverless orchestration is, is the other part of the 10x architectural advantage because it makes um, things so much more efficient uh, in, terms of, um, um, in terms of not over-provisioning things. Um, so that's our 10x architectural advantage. That architectural advantage is multiplied by the fact that everything is open sourced. And um, an open source uh, is the uh, contribution to trust, right? People build trust because the technology is open source. It's a contribution to potentially partner with uh, people who want to bring Neon um, somewhere else, not just the three major cloud clouds, which is our focus right now. And open source is also uh, um, taking contributions from the rest of the world. Uh, and all three of, of, of them are starting to show signs of life. Uh, so, so in a way, open source is also architecture, um, like, believe it or not. Um, so so that's, the, that's the 10x architectural advantage. Um, within that, branching is a, um, uh, is a byproduct of separating of storage and compute. We knew how important that scenario is. And since you're building your storage from scratch, you're building, you know, like the, the, the storage is all written um, at, at Neon and we didn't really take any external components to that. Then um, you can architect it the way that branches are very, very cheap for you because we use copy on write. Interesting. Um, so is, is the storage component of Neon is, is separate than like the, the standard Postgres storage component? Um, in a way. Yeah. So if you, um, if you look at Postgres storage engine, um, it, it has multiple layers as well. And at the very lowest layer, uh, Postgres requests, uh, pages from disk. So you can like dive deep in the code and you will see that, that, that Postgres requests, uh, you know, reads a page, eight kilobyte page from a hard drive. And then there is a place where, uh, Postgres writes the transaction log record on disk at the time of transaction commit and uh, F-syncs that data. So Postgres obviously is a system of record. You need to F-sync to know it's there. Um, we intercept um, these two code paths. Uh, and instead of uh, reading a page from local disk, uh, Postgres uh, uh, makes an RPC call uh, into our storage uh, and requested that page over the network. If you think about that, um, that might be slower. Um, think about the fact that oftentimes people attach network, attach, uh, uh, attach disks such as EBS volumes to run Postgres anyway. Yeah. So that interaction is, go, is going over the network anyway. Uh, and the other one is writing a transaction log record on disk. Um, instead of writing it locally, we send it over the network into our service that's called Safekeepers. Um, that's really it. Um, the, so that the API between Postgres and, and storage is not your file system API. It's uh, basically a custom engineered API that fits very, very well to, uh, into Postgres internals. Um, the rest of the machinery of the Postgres storage engine is the same. You know, um, you know heaps, vtrees, indexes, all of that stuff stays. You know, vacuum, which is like an unfortunate byproduct of, of Postgres design is still there. Yeah. Um, but um, when Postgres writes something to disk, instead of disk, it goes into into the Neon storage. Gotcha. So just at that very boundary there. Okay, that's great. So you mentioned uh, the the 10x architectural difference being separation of compute and storage. And like, what's the technological trigger that that made this happen? Is it is it just the cloud and the elasticity of the cloud, or like what's different? Is it something about chips or SSDs, or what, what's the big difference there that made this possible? I think um, there are a few things that made it possible. Um, I think it's like network latencies and NVMEs. Um, the the network latencies they and, and network bandwidth they keep keep shrinking, um, and so now you don't really see that much of a difference uh, between uh, running Postgres on uh, locally versus uh, you know having storage that 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 runs over the network. Um, the second um, thing is. Um, well, I think I think the scenario has matured as well. So um, uh, the scenario has matured, and um, some of the light was shown by Snowflake, um, and the the scenarios of Snowflake are different, right? It's they're they're focused in analytics. 
Um, but separation of storage and compute was a huge deal for, for Snowflake and it unlocked certain scenarios. In the meantime, you know, the, the software development practices evolved around CI, CD and Git. Um, and now everybody needs preview environments. Everybody um, connects things like Vercel to their GitHub repos to pick things up and publish them on the web uh, and create, you know, sandbox URLs that you can share around. So, so multiplayer, uh, I, oh, I guess I shouldn't call it multiplayer. I should call it like just team collaboration yeah. um, went leaps and bounds. Um, and those dev platforms took, you know, full advantage of this and, and provided a ton of value for that. And so database kind of felt stuck. Right. Um, so there is a little bit of, of, of hardware, uh, hardware and cloud uh, enablers. But I think the biggest driver is what people actually want to do with it. Um, so that allowed us to to, to build this uh, the right way. Awesome. Um, I, I want to talk to you about just a few things you've been thinking about. And it's, it relates to like a thesis I've been having. I've, re I've read like the Amazon Aurora paper and the more recent Amazon DynamoDB paper. And like one thing you notice there with these like cloud-based managed services is sort of the number of internal services it takes to manage all those different things and how they work together. And I was wondering if they were starting to tilt the playing field away from open source and more towards proprietary stuff, just because you can have these operational teams that can handle that. But it's interesting because you all are open source. You have a few different services, compute, storage. You mentioned Safekeeper or what the transaction log was. Yeah. Like is Kubernetes helping manage that as well? Or because now you can, it's easier to run multiple services rather than just being like, Hey, I only want to spin up a, a Postgres binary and not run anything else. Whereas now with Kubernetes, it's easier to run these systems or like what's sort of enabling, enabling that. Yeah. I, I think um, it's a lot easier to, to put things together to, to, these days. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you touched on, the, on a couple of points. First of all is uh, do clouds a road open source. Um, we actually had a, um, a very interesting dinner with Christian Kleinerman, who is the chief product officer of Snowflake. And um, his point of view, obviously from the from the uh, uh, Snowflake Mountain, is well, hey, um, uh, it doesn't matter as much open source or not because everything is cloud. Uh, and since everything is cloud, it's all about simplicity, ease of consumption, consumption based model, and, and value uh, driven to the customer. And then on the other side of the spectrum, in the same category of data and analytics, there's Databricks that started with the open source project, which is Spark, um, and took full advantage of, of, of open source. So I, I think we'll see the world of both. Um, I think every infrastructure project is going to be cloud, full stop. And within every infrastructure close, uh, projects, there will be cloud that are fully proprietary. And there will be clouds that that open source their um, their implementations. Um, our mission is kind of is to build a fabric that runs the internet, and we want that fabric to be open source. Um, I think it creates a more durable technology uh, uh, over time, and it, it it creates opportunities to to be absolutely pervasive. And I think if you have want to see an example of it, that's Postgres. Yep. Right, they, they, that technology became absolutely pervasive. Um, I I don't believe into into proprietary on-prem software. That's I think that category by itself I think is going away. Um, I believe in cloud services, um, and kind of my dream is that open source run runs uh, runs the internet. So yep. so that's kind of one of the reasons for us to choose that open source route. Yeah. I love that um, that dream and just like never bet against open source. Um, I also just think it's cool sort of the vision you're saying of having these read only branches of your data, maybe stored on Neon's technology, but then you can imagine Fly hosting like compute of Neon that, that connects to those things and you can have different yeah. services sort of. There's the, the shared there. Slack channel with Fly. So really? we're, yeah, we're, like we, we, yeah, we, we absolutely, uh, we're absolutely talking uh, to Kurt about this. So in terms of branching, you mentioned copy on write and, and that how, how, how that enables it. What is copy on write? Well, um, so copy on write is when you request a particular page uh, in the Neon storage, um, you refer to that page by, um, let's just simplify it a little bit, by page ID and uh, log sequence number and, and branch ID. And when you create a branch, all you do is create a new branch ID. And um, when, when you request uh, 
a page uh, in the new branch with a new branch ID, but it keeps the same LSN, it points to the same page. So creating of a branch is a meta size of metadata operation. You know, I created a new branch ID. Um, and then it forks it, right? And if you start writing in the new branch, it will start creating new pages that are not visible to the, to the parent branch. Um, but as long as you're querying old pages, which the majority, at least at the moment of the creation of the branch, the majority of the page, pages will be old, um, you will be requesting um, the same page. So you're not really doubling your storage when, when you're creating your branch. That's what copy and write is. When you start modifying that page, then we'll create an additional page and the new branch will have that page and the old branch will have the old page. But as long as you're not modifying anything, um, they will be pointing to the same branch. So it's copy and write is a kind of general purpose. It's a concept. Um, and our particular implementation uh, does copy and write um, uh, specifically at the page level. What, what I knew about copy, like the most popular open source to co copy and write technology is probably ZFS. Um, and um, what's interesting, there's a, a relatively big company built around ZFS and database workloads, uh, and that company is uh, Delphix. So it's a it's a company that that packages ZFS and 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 creates developer experience around um, around those copies, uh, uh, and they use it to run all sorts of databases on it and and improves dev test staging uh, environments um, in the old world, in the old on-prem world. I don't I actually don't know, but you know, the, the last time I checked, uh, they were mostly proprietary technology that, that runs in the data center. So I know their customers, I know their founders. Um, I think it's a very cool idea, um, but it's due to the, the, the nature of their distribution it's only accessible to a relatively small number of people in large enterprises um, that uh, that run uh, you know fleets of databases on prem. We're here uh, saying, hey, this is a great idea, but we want to give it to everyone, and we want to give it to everyone for like trivial consumption in the cloud. Yeah, cool, awesome. I want to talk a little bit about performance and and like a few questions around like performance, how well, like how well are you trying to, how do you compare yourself to, to bog standard Postgres? Should it be pretty equivalent there? And especially as you move into things like offloading to S3 or, you know, sort of more dynamic compute, how does that affect things? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, performance starts with goals, right? Um, at, at single store to, to contrast this with Ian, our goals, is, goals were to be the fastest analytical solution on the planet. And uh, uh, you know the the people who like absolutely love single store really loves its performance. Uh, they're like, well, this is the best thing, the fastest thing since sliced bread. Uh, we sunk an enormous amount of um, engineering into this, and and that what created this passion following. Um, at Neon, our performance bar is Aurora, so we want to be uh, just as good or better than Aurora, um, and we'll do we'll do what. What kind of what what modern hardware allows us to do, um, and uh, we certainly don't want to be worse than Aurora. Um, and all our internal tests um, are comparing Neon with Aurora, especially with Aurora Serverless. Um, I think um, I think we may be pleasantly surprised. Uh, we are learning that Aurora is uh, is good but not great. Um, and that keeps us optimistic that we can be uh, for certain scenarios. And databases are such a vast surface area that that you can't just say you're faster. You can be faster for this scenario, uh, and that scenario will be relatively narrow. Um, we'll, we'll see certain scenarios we're already faster than Aurora. For certain scenarios, we're slower than Aurora. Um, and we're digging in. Um, the they, the way to to work with performance is. Uh, well, understand all the variables that go into do, into this. Um, you know, be confident about your architecture. If if you find issues, you obviously change it, and then spend a lot of iterations of you know producing flame graphs um, and uh, figuring out where the bottlenecks are. So I don't I don't have a better solution here. Um, but but back to the goals is our goal is to be on par or faster than AWS Aurora. Nice, awesome. Uh, going back to your your tweet earlier about you know finding finding an advantage, your second step was hey build a freakishly good engineering team for that. 
what were you looking for in the neon team? How hard was it to find these people? I'm, I'm sure you've been in the database world for a while, but like, what did that sort of look like in building out this initial team? Yeah, yeah when you think about this, um, you, you kind of want to start with the founding team. And um, the, the founding team, in my opinion, should have all the ingredients that given enough time without any additional help, being able to build the full product. Uh, or at least build the, the, the full product in its first iteration. Um, uh, and I'm not talking about the MVP. I'm talking about, you know, the product that can actually generate revenue. So there's going to, should be enough DNA in the, in the founding team, uh, to, to be able for, for you to get there. This actually allows you, weirdly enough, um, allows you to hire better, right? Because like-minded people, uh, want to join join the crusade the um and and we're blessed with the fact that uh, uh that the two are the co-founders Heiki and and stas uh who are both both hackers um possess uh all the required dna to to deliver uh to deliver on on the vision well the team is now is pushing 40 uh, uh 40 people and the majority of those uh, of those folks are are engineers um here are the few things that, that helped us uh, um, uh, hire this team relatively quickly, and I'm very proud uh, about the capabilities of that team. Uh, some of them are more controversial than others, uh, so we'll talk about them. Um, the first one is open source, right? It you know believe it or not, it's easier to hire for the open source project than to, than than for the non open source project, and then your your work is out out there for everyone on display for everybody to see. So if you go and look at the Neon repo, very easy to see who's the most productive. By the way, that's Heiki. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then um, and then it's easy to see, uh, um, you know, everyone's contribution. You know, there, there are some really, you know, complex pieces of code that, that more like art uh, than, and then you can, you can see, and people are really proud of their work that they put into open source projects. And they know that others will be looking. The second thing uh, that helped us is Rust. So we chose early on that our storage will be built in Rust. Um, uh, my, my friend and the first engineer at uh, MemSQL, Alex Skidanov, who later built a company, a crypto company called Neo Protocol, uh, told me once that, you know, there will be a day that somebody is gonna start a database project um, and they will decide to build it in Rust and they will move uh, multiple times faster than an alternative project in written C++ and, you know, single stars written in C++. Um, um, and, um, and then, so I spent some time understanding why that is and, uh, wrote some, some, some small amount of code in Rust, just like, just to see what, what, what it feels like. And it became clear that this is the future. And it, and also it's going to be easier to attract the next generation systems developer uh, if your core project is written in Rust. That paid off. That paid off. One of the uh, most productive folks on the team is a, is a former member of Rust Analyzer. And, um, you know, it's just an example of just the choice of what you write your, your project in also contributes to your ability to hire. The second is super controversial. The third one is super controversial. And then people just argue at nauseum about this. And that is, are you remote first or are you uh, in the office in real life? Um, and yesterday when we were going around the table and there were some really cool companies, you know, uh, at, 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 when the dinner with Christian Feinerman of, of Snowflake and really cool, cool companies around the table um, debated, you know, are we, you know, this is so cool when everybody is in one place and it's, uh, you know, if you, if you're not, you lose on serendipitous and inter interactions. Um, and then when you remote, you have, um, you have easier access to talent. So, um, so we chose to be remote. We started during the pandemic. Uh, our payroll started March 1st, 21. Um, and it, we found it's, it's, it's easier to, to find, uh, it just the right person. If you're fishing in the global pond, um, but we're losing out on those serendipitous interactions. So I'm, that's that's the third piece. 
Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It's, it's a little bit of both. I was going to ask when, when you all started working on, on Neon. So March of, of 21. So about a year and a half and you're already, I mean, you, it was a year and a quarter into public beta is all it took. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and March 1st, we only had a, you know, we had myself, Heike and Stas and, and a slide deck. Wow. That's amazing. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, quick. Uh, two last questions I want to get for you. Number one, so you were, you know, a founder of an infrastructure startup before, single store, you know, lots of great success there. I know some friends that that really love it. What did you learn from that experience that you're that you're bringing over to Neon? Yeah, I I think um, I think the thing that I learned, um, and um, those are bets, right? So, uh, single store is clearly a success. Uh, most likely the company will go public. Uh, and um, that's, that, that's really amazing. It's like how often this happens. Um, the, um, but there were things that were hard. Um, and single store has a ton of technology. So meaning if you, if you say, oh, I'm going to build a database. On top of it, you say, I'm going to build all parts of that database. I'm going to build storage and compute uh, and a cloud service and various on-prem installs. Um, that, that is just a lot of technology uh, within the database, storage, compute, query optimization, query execution. Then you say, I'm gonna cover transactional and analytical workloads. Um, so it's, it's just a, 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 a vast system uh, that people, uh, when they look at it, they don't believe that, the, that this can work, but it does. Yeah. Um, in Etnium, we're incredibly narrow. So we're saying we're only cloud, you know, bits are open source, but uh, uh, we are offering consumption only in the cloud. If you want to, you know, ro roll the bits yourself, you're on your own. Uh, it's only serverless. It's only Postgres. We're starting with only AWS. We, we're going to run um, other clouds. And what I, what I see that allows you to do is it allows you to focus, right? And, and we're, also, we're also not rebuilding compute. That's Postgres. We only build in storage. So it's actually a lot less technology that we're building here at Neon, um, and we but we uh, that allows us to make that technology really deep, and it also allows us to create lots and lots of friends. So now every analytical system is our friend, uh, right? Because we are not encroaching on on their on their territory. Um, every uh, every company that is building for the Postgres ecosystem, and we didn't fork Postgres, uh, it's just Postgres, is our friend. Um, uh, every distribution platform that needs a database is our friend. Um, every organization uh, that just runs Postgres already is, a, is our potential customer. So, um, so that's one thing that, it, that I learned um, uh, from the single store experience. Um, that, and that's what we do differently. Um, the, the, the thing that we're going to do the same is the quality of the engineering team and the engineering bar. Um, I think, you know, um, Single store ended up being a global company. There are at least seven offices, I think, uh, around the world now. And uh, so we're going to do the same for, but from day zero. But in terms of like the quality of the systems engineer on the team uh, is just as good or higher. So that, that, that would be another lesson learned. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Just to wrap it up, let's talk about the future. What like what are you excited about? What are you seeing either in terms of you know what's happening with Neon, what's happening with just databases, what's happening with applications? Like what what are you excited about and what are you seeing? Yeah, um, great question. I I think the 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 problem of purely running your app on a cloud database is for the most part sold, right? And you can get that solution on on uh, the cloud providers. You can get that solution on Heroku as uh, Heroku's and the like, DigitalOcean, Ivan, you know, lots of lots of places. Um, I think the problem of, of helping uh, developers uh, build an app uh, on a database is far from sold. So databases give you very, very little support for the modern developer workflow. Um, and the, the architecture kind of prevents them from, from doing that, which I think is the, the biggest opportunity for Neon. Um, where the world is heading is uh, increasingly greater amount of automation. So once the the, the, the systems part and the, the key workflow parts uh, like branchings are out of the way and all the integrations with, with, the, uh, with the modern dev platforms are built, we're gonna keep investing in ways of helping developers build their apps. Um, 
some of the things we're exploring, and I can't obviously commit to, to any of that because it's in a lab. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it may or may not happen and may or may not be the right approach. Uh, and sometimes I say something and the, the team freaks out. Um, but the stuff that, that we are looking at uh, is um, with the advances of, of AI, um, it, it seems silly that we as developers still need to choose indexes for our databases. Um, it feels like this should be automated. Um, the enabling technology at Neon is, uh, is, is one click creating a test playground. So we can create a test play, playground and, and auto create indexes. Uh, and then we know your workload as well. So we can, we can prove to you that, that your workload, uh, the, the performance improves, uh, and you don't break anything. Um, does it have to be AI? Uh, maybe it doesn't have to be there. Like research starting from like early two thousands that can do that with like just imperatively or, you know, like irregular algorithms. Oh, we can do it with AI. Um, I don't know what the right solution is, but I do know that that it's kind of silly to to push that complexity on on, on the users. Um, uh, speaking of AI, though, um, uh, think about think about a, a workflow of a modern developer. Usually, this person is an expert in whatever language uh, this person uses. You know, should it be JavaScript or Go or Java, or whatever? It doesn't matter what it is. But that is the primary programming language for this person. And typically, with the interaction with the database, that language is like SQL is not is not the, the number one language uh, for, for that person. And so that's where like Copilot or Replit Ghostwriter um, is, uh, could, could provide uh, additional value to go and help you write that SQL. And you know, Neon can be a, a part of that or Copilot can start generating SQL or an interaction between the two. The other thing is, and those demos like keep blowing my mind. You can, you can, um, you can generate code or you can translate from one, one code to another and uh, OpenAI famously showed how to translate from JavaScript to Python. Uh, and when I look at it, I don't understand why I wouldn't be able, be able to translate from JavaScript to SQL and make it a part of, of a workflow. Of course, you need to know what the schema is, but that's where Neon comes in, providing that information to, to AI. Um, once you are a lot more fluid translating code or, or generating code for, um, for your workflow, for, for your program, you're not interrupting developer flow. Um, and that's a big deal. Um, and then from there, you know, there's all sorts of databases that are out there. There's like, uh, there, there are companies that use Sybase and they have like, you know, Sybase is, it's not long gone. It's still there, but like nobody wakes up and start and starts new projects on Sybase, but they have this like large footprints. Um, and then those have stored procedures and whatnot. So it, it, it would be great if we could just migrate those stored procedures using AI, using like co-translation technologies into Postgres and provide some sort of interactive way for, for developers, uh, to do that. Um, yeah, uh, just this, these observations is like, you know, people do know SQL, but like a small subset of those people, uh, know, you know, post good stored procedure language. Yeah. And so that's where like generative technologies, that's where autocompletes, that's where, um, copilot, uh, can make a big difference in just how fast you progress. Yeah. Awesome. And especially like, I know in the JavaScript TypeScript ecosystem, you're seeing things like Prisma. So you get more typing around your database and, and that taking off and that interacting with Copilot and being able to, like you're saying, go from JavaScript, what you want in JavaScript and getting it, it directly in SQL in a nice, uh, clean way. That that's pretty awesome. I assume, I assume that your team is doing something at the storage level, level a little more, uh, involved than just co-piloting from, from C to Rust, uh, for the, for the Postgres storage. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't do any of that. Yeah. yeah. The storage, <laughs> the storage system is, 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 uh, is built from first principles and from scratch. Yeah, um, yeah. You can, you can trace it and it's all public, right? It's all on yeah. GitHub. Oh uh, yeah, I'm I'm sure I'm sure that's some some cool stuff, and and um, I'm I'm excited to see the progress here. I you know, again, I started with Postgres; that was my first database love, and and uh, really been looking for something that fits well in the serverless world. So, uh, Nikita, thank you for coming on today. I'll be you know I'll be watching Neon going forward. Um, for people that want to go check out more about Neon, where can they where can they find Neon? Where can they find you? Um, well, there's Neon.tech. 
Uh, my email is uh, Nikita at neon.tech. Uh, my, uh, my Twitter handle is NikitaBase. Um, and uh, <laughs> I actually recently changed it. It's kind of funny. Uh, it sounds funny. Uh, I, I keep working on database technologies, and uh, so so I think it kind of fits. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, those are the two. DMs are open. Awesome. Sounds great. Nikita Shamganov, thank you for joining us on Software Engineering Daily.